Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance as Auguste Shri Prabhupada. Welcome devotees to our morning Bhagavatam class. This morning we are continuing with Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse 35. And the chapter is entitled, How Prichard Received the Age of Kali. And we are in the middle of this, we are in the middle of the discussion between Dharma and Mother Earth about the atrocities of what's about to happen and how it's, what's going to happen in Kali Yoga. So and we are very happy to have. His Holiness Chandramani Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All grace to proper, all grace to you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Great to see you and all the devotees. Sure. So far, please, yeah, he can send me the young, he can young, how to know by the world and the world. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Tavasahe Puriham Puru Shotamasyam. Prema Valoka Uchiha Smita Vava Jalpai. Sayam Samana Haramadu Mani Munam Romat Savo Mamayat Hungry Vitanti Tayaha Who, therefore, can tolerate the pangs of separation from that Supreme Personality of Godhead? He could conquer the gravity and passionate wrath of his sweethearts like Satyabhama by his sweet smile of love, pleasing grants and hardly, hardly appeal. When he traversed my earth surface, I would be immersed in the dust of his lotus feet and dust with his sumptuous covered with grass which appeared like hair standing on me out of pleasure. There were chances of separation between the Lord and his thousands of queens because of the Lord being absent from home. But as far as his connection with earth was concerned, the Lord would traverse the earth with his lotus feet, and therefore there was no chance of separation. When the Lord left the surface of the earth to return to his spiritual abode, the earth's feeling of separation was therefore more acute. Omagyan <laughs> Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Goyavani, Pachari, Nirvi, Sesa, Sunni, Avani, Pastyatya, Dosa, Tari, Nevansha, Kalpa, Thiru, Vishya, Kripa, Sindhu, Pei, Vacha, Patitaram, Bhavani, Gyo, Vaishnavi, Gyo, Namaha, Namaha, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Mukhyananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadara, Sudhartha, Digor, Bhaktivindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Hare Hare. So all of creation is personal. But unfortunately, we don't see it like that. And here it's given the understanding that the earth is lamenting uh, soon that the Lord will leave the earth planet. And there will be feelings of separation from the Lord. Earth is called Bhumi Devi. She's actually one of the seven mothers that are listed in the Shastras. And she is practically prominent, the most one of the most prominent of all the mothers because she provides all the necessities of life that the living entity requires in order to live. That's just food, or air, and uh, human, you know, 
anything that the that is within the nature's arrangement is also given by Mother Earth. She also restricts when people are sinful. Uh, she is the uh, what we say the uh, energy of the Lord for providing for the living entities and also punishing the living entities both. <laughs> like a mother who has children when the children become obedient to the mother and serve the mother nicely and grow up according to how they should mother feels happy and then they automatically receive all the benefits but when they disobey the mother or neglect the mother or do things opposite to the mother's instructions then the mother will punish in different ways. And one of the ways the earth punishes is she withholds her bounty. This is mentioned also in the fourth canto. When Maharaj Bunt, King, King Bunt, King Vena, was the son of Maharaj Agnidra, he became the king. And when his father left everything and went to the forest, he was the heir to the throne. But his mother, the wife of Agnita, was, demon, was a demon. And uh, because of that, well, she was actually very sinful, not so much a demon, but she was low class. Um, he developed those qualities. And when he took the position of ruling, he was acting against Brahminical culture and restricting and even depriving the Brahmins for their their proper service in providing the knowledge that people needed in order to gain, along with restricting the sacrifices that the medical culture follows. And so, and he was also very harsh on the citizens. His only good quality was harsh on the rogues too. And so he would punish them very severely. But because of his rule, was sinful, at one point the Brahmins decided to remove him from his position. And Brahmins were powerful. They performed austerities, they followed the Vedas, and so, and they were pure in their activities. And so they would chant mantras, and they could chant mantras that would have a particular effect when the mantra was directed. And these Brahmins, they chanted these mantras to kill Vena, and it worked. They, they killed him through chanting of the mantras because he was acting against religious principles when they would say, well, you have to, you know, you're the king, you're the representative of God. He would say, yes, I'm not the representative of God, I am God. <laughs> so this would get the Brahmins really upset and he would make similar statements about, you know, Brahminical culture. And so in order to relieve the burden of the earth, they removed this king by chanting mantras. And then his body, as it's mentioned, it was churned. And from the churning came two living beings. One was called Bahuka, which was a low caste person who was sent to live in the forest. And the second one, after his body became purified from the first churning, the second person came out was Prithu, who later became the next king of the world, which we know as Prithu Maharaj, very saintly and very powerful king. When Prithu Maharaj took his throne, you could see that the earth was withholding because of the previous administration. And so he approached Mother Earth and asked her, to perform sacrifice. And he said, I would perform sacrifices, and then you provide all of the uh, necessities that people need to live nicely and happily. So that was the arrangement. So there, in that example, we see how you know, when the rulers of the world become sinful, Mother Earth punishes the world in different ways, and people are going on also to follow the world. So you see that in some places in the world there is a great scarcity, and other places there is a great, uh, profuse amount of 
and uh, supplies. And there are people who are you know, always in need of the basic things in life because of the restrictions that are going on the earth. What you do to the demonic need that is present in the world and in the world. So here, the earth is expressing her feelings of separation. Um, the relationship with the Lord is of two kinds. For my Vipalam and Sambo. Vipalam means to worship the Lord in the mood of separation from the Lord. And the other was to worship the Lord in the mood of meeting the Lord, of being with the Lord. So in both of these forms of worship um, are authorized forms of how to approach the Supreme. The intensity of devotion is always greater in the mood of separation. Because in that mood, there is the mood of longing, of wanting to be with the Lord again. Or wanting to experience the presence of the Lord so one can offer service to the Lord. So this mood of separation is actually the foundation by which Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu based his philosophical teaching. Ugaitam nimeshena chakshusha pavishaitam shunyaitam sarvam govinda vilahinam that feeling separation from the Lord uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the mood of his pure devotee is expressing that mood by saying that every moment appears to be 12 years or more and the tears are falling from my eyes like torrents of rain and I'm feeling very unhappy in your absence. So this mood is actually very powerful. It's even greater than the mood of of uh, meeting the Lord. So sometimes when we meet the Lord and we are in association, we may also not not take advantage of that association, but in the mood of separation. Of course, in the material world, when people experience separation in a material sense, there is some of these same symptoms but they have a tendency to die at a, at a particular time. They're not ongoing. Because in this material world, people will have a relationship. And then when that relationship is over or parted by time or circumstance, people want to fulfill that void by, again, finding another relationship. So there may be some separation for a while, and that no, but after some time, it doesn't withstand. But in the spiritual realm, within relationship with the Lord, because we are eternally connected with the Lord, that mood of separation is exhibited by wanting to do more and more service. This is how Lord Chaitanya uh, is explaining and performing devotional service. That that mood of separation is like the the, or the mood of worship is the mood of trying to meet Krishna through the process of serving Krishna, and in devotional service, that is the hankering that by my service maybe Krishna will come and accept my service. Krishna will appear to me in different ways. So that is the hankering that the devotee wants. Then Prabhupada said, we should desire like that. We should want to see the Lord, he said. Of course, there's other statements that appear to be contrary, but in one particular statement, he does make that point. It comes up in the uh, 13th chapter of um, the same first canto when Vidura is instructing Dhritarashtra about how he is overly dependent 
in a very pitiable way on the people that he tried to destroy after he lost the battle of Kudushetra and his sons were killed, he took shelter of the Pandavas who really were his enemies in that, in that battle. But because they were related, they took care of him in a very pitiable condition and simply accepting all of their care like a dog who receives remnants from the master. And so Vidura wanted to enlighten his brother that you know, you're wasting your life. You should uh, leave home and go to the forest and uh, perform austerities and penances and worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And of course, after hearing the instructions of his brother, he did that. So throughout the uh, Vedic scriptures, and especially in the life of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we find this mood of separation is very much prominent. And devotees can practice this mood by wanting to serve the Lord more and better, more and more better and better. Praying to the Lord, my dear Lord, I'm so unqualified, yet I have this desire to be with you. So please uh, give me your mercy. And then people can express that mood of separation in different ways, by ready writing letters to the Lord, by praying to the Lord, by uh, taking on more service just to please the Lord, putting more quality in our service and so we find more happiness in our expression. All of these are ways to uh, practice this mood of separation. But we see, I mean, the prime example is the gopis in Vrindavan. When Krishna was in Vrindavan uh, and Kamsa wanted to make a plan to kill Krishna, so he sent Akrura to bring Krishna to Mathura. And then Kamsa had this plan that he was going to arrange a wrestling match and that would be the way to eliminate Krishna. So Krura, he knew that Krishna could not be killed. And so he went on behalf of, uh, of Kamsa and he came to Vrindavan and he made his petition that actually, and the Lord knew that this was an opportunity to remove Kamsa. So he, he decided to go to Mathura. But when the gopis realized, not only the gopis, but Mother Yasoda, all of the residents of Vrindavan, when they understood Krishna was preparing to leave, uh, they practically lost consciousness and were praying and also begging Krishna to stay. And Krishna had, well, had a mission. You see, the Lord, when he comes to the world, he, he has his loving relationship with his devotees, but he also has a mission. And many times he accepts the mission as the most prominent thing. And he, uh, he tries to give association with his devotees occasionally, but his mission, he, uh, he carries out. And then he has to pravitranayam sadhanam vinasanaya to do scripts to kill and remove their religion and reestablishing Dharma, Sanatana Dharma, eternal religious principle. So when uh, there was a chariot arranged and Krishna was and Balaram were boarding the chariot to leave and everyone was in anxiety and especially the gopis and uh, they were running in front of the chariot and falling on the in the ground so the chariot would not move. <laughs> they were thinking it's better that we give up our life and Krishna leaves and gives up our association. But after some time, it was determined that Krishna was going to leave. But Krishna said something before he left to the gopis, which really gave them some solace, not much, and that solace was, I'll be back. 
I'll be back. So he said that, and that gave them a little feelings of hope. But still, they were feeling that 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 anticipation of separation. And Akrura, who came to take Krishna, he was simply acting on on the uh, on the will of Krishna, which was coming indirectly through Kamsa, because Krishna wanted to go and kill Kamsa. And so, but the gopis were angry at Akrura, and they cursed him. He said, you're not Akrura, you're Krura. Akrura means kind, and Krura means cruel. And they were calling him cruel, and they cursed him. And later, because of that curse, uh, Akrura had to suffer. He actually did things that he would never not normally do. He got involved with this intrigue with the Salman Taka jewel and became a party in stealing the jewel, which was against the will of Christian. So that was due to the curse of the Gopis. We should understand how this works also, that uh, if we do something that is contrary to religious principle, and it causes uh, distress to others, we will get a reaction, even if we are supposedly a great soul, a person who is fixed in devotional service. So everyone has to act carefully according to religious principles. And therefore one has to know what is religious principle. If we don't know what religious principles are, or we don't know what irreligious principles are, and we act contrary, the idea of not knowing is not an excuse. Prabhupada would give the example that in the courtroom, the man is in front of the judge and he makes his plea, my dear, my dear, your honor, I didn't know this was wrong. The judge says, ignorance is no excuse. <laughs> You're you have to pay the penalty. So in the same way, we have to know, because if we don't, we will make mistakes and get trapped by the material energy or do things wrong. So it's very care. We have to know what it is religious principles and make sure we follow them carefully and at the same time avoid irreligious activities or things that are contrary to our spiritual practice. Therefore, Sanatana Goswami explains um, that there are two principles in full surrender to the Lord. One is called Anukulena, and the other one is called Pratikul. Pratikulena. Anukulena means to accept favorable things for devotional service, and Pratikul means to avoid things that are unfavorable. Uh, from my experience in Krishna consciousness, I see devotees have a tendency to know what is right, but they don't have a tendency to know what is wrong. <laughs> and so many times they cover their, their advancement in devotional service by acting in the wrong way. And there's another type of uh, wrong activity. That means if you're supposed to do something, and you don't do it, and that is called offense by omission. Like if you're, just like if your spiritual master walks in the room and you fail to honor or pay obeisance, that's an offense. Even though you didn't do anything, still that's offense by omission. That happened to Indra when Brihaspati walked into the assembly where Indra was being worshipped, and Indra didn't pay any attention to his spiritual master. Brihaspati stopped at the door, noted Indra's impudence, turned around and walked out. And then Indra realized that he had committed this offense by the mission, and he wanted to apologize to his spiritual master, but he couldn't find him anywhere. And Brihaspati disappeared. And right after that, the demigods lost their, their foot, foothold in the heavenly planets and the demons became prominent. And Bali Maharaj came into the kingdom to fight against the demigods. The demigods couldn't even fight. They just ran. 
And that was due to the offense of injury, offense by omission. But here we're hearing about the mood of separation. So when Krishna told the gopis, uh, I'll be back, they had that hope that someday he would be back. But he left and didn't come back for, it says for a hundred years. He did come back. But Radharani, she expressed her mood of separation at one point. But in that mood, she is saying, she's praying to the Lord, she's speaking to the Lord, my dear Lord, uh, you are like a hunter that keeps animals locked up in a room. And the animals cannot get out and you have set the room on fire. So the animals are burning in the fire in the same time they cannot get out. So in the same way, I am burning in the fire of separation from you. I want to die because of that separation, but I can't because you have locked the door with the statement, I'll be back. I'll be back. So that was Radharani's mood. So yeah, so this mood of separation causes, and so the devotees should understand that this is what it means. It's for us, we, we are we are called Purvaras. Purvaras means loving Krishna before meeting Krishna. Loving Krishna before meeting Krishna. So, is it possible that that has any value? Yes, but at the same time, there is a, a point there that it needs to be explained, and that is, we were with Krishna in the spiritual world. We simply forgot. Because when we come to the material world, as soon as you take on a body, you forget. Just like we had a previous life prior to the life we are in now. But we don't remember that life because as soon as we take on another body, we forget. We forget. So this forgetfulness is a feature of the material tabernacle, which causes the, the living entity to think in the wrong way or not to understand their relationship with Krishna. But the scriptures explain and give us a clear understanding. Yeah. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhu Tabunoi Sravanadi Siddhi Chitte Kodiyori Doi. Each one of us has an eternal loving relationship with the Lord that is never lost but only forgotten. Now, the goal of human life is to reawaken that relationship and engage in devotional service to the Lord. There is no second goal. All other activities we may perform has to be supportive or in connection to achieving that goal, which is engaging in transcendental loving service to the Lord. Okay, so we'll stop there and see if there's any response. Thank you so much, Martha. Such a wonderful class. And um, really getting into the details of how we should be cautious and always serving and not and always remembering the lord in our service we have a question Maharaj, but i'm going to ask the others first before we go in if there are any questions that devotees would ask any i'm, I'm going to stop sharing <clears throat> so that we can see all the participants and we ask the devotees if you're able to um turn on your cameras please do so where you're at so that we can see each other and Maharaj can see us. Uh, Dear Krishna, I think you had a question first. Do you want to go first, Prabhu, or do you want me to ask? Okay. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful class. I love the way you put it, how you have locked up this material world. Mother Earth is expressing emotion. Uh, you also mentioned about the service. So sometimes, we are very inconsistent. How to deal with that inconsistency in our service? Sometimes we are very charged up. Sometimes we just don't care. Sometimes it is motivated, motivated by you know, getting some prestige or cognition. 
Um, so did everyone get the question? Not Mark, really. can we speak for him. Um, I, I think uh, what he asked is, how can we be how can we be consistent in our service? Sometimes we get charged, then we drop, then we pick up, then we drop. Sometimes we just want recognition when there is a crowd, and when there's no crowd, then we take a back seat uh, because there's no point. There's no one to recognize us, and sometimes we just cannot maintain the 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 the, the continuous um, service attitude. Right, dear Krishna? Okay. Now, Rupa Goswami explains the process of bhakti through the different stages. And after becoming initiated by the spiritual master, the spiritual master gives the direction and the philosophical understanding by which the disciple can execute devotional service. And that's meant to clear away the anarthas. And there are 16 anarchers that's mentioned by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur and his Bhajana Rahasya. And these anarthas are blocks. As long as there is anarthas there, there will be un unsteady devotional service. And depending on the quality of the anartha or type of the anartha, that steadiness will be more or less. The unsteadiness will be more or less. So when we practice devotional service, and it is about getting rid of the anartha both through the process and becoming aware what are those anarthas and carefully avoiding them. Two aspects of removing anartha. So that if we become aware of them and we try to remove them, that's one way. But that is insufficient to get results. We have to also chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, follow the process given by the spiritual master. That is purifying. So both of these has to go on simultaneously. And if we just chant and uh, perform the activity, but we're not aware of the month of the different anarthas, we may again fall, become unsteady in our devotional service inadvertently. We're not being not aware of that also. And so when 75% of the anarthas are removed, then you come to the stage of nishta. Nishta means steadiness. So that's then one one will be fixed in the process of devotional service. So therefore, we have to be very conscious of what is our what is blocking us in devotional service, and very carefully remove that, avoid it, remove it, and stay fixed in our practice of devotional service. So unsteady bhakti is mentioned there in uh, Madhurya Kandambini. Vishwanath Chakravarti gives seven th six things which are the foundations which are called unsteady bhakti. And one of them is the uh, Ranga Tarangini. Ranga Tarangini is oh, seeing the benefits that one gets from devotional service as an indications of one's advancement. Now, you might get position, you might get praise, you might also gain some, some material renovations. A lot of ways that, that Krishna reciprocates or through the material energy, the devotees progress, things to start to develop in that way. And one of seeing these things as one's advancement that is, that is one of the anarchists. The advancement is the purification of the heart. And then the advancement is indicated by the qualities that the devotee exhibits and not so much what they have or what they have done. These things are secondary. So we have to be aware that, that Ranga Tarangini is one again, on again, off again, I'm going to chant 64 rounds today and every day, and I'm going to be really fixed. I'm going to eat less. I'm going to, you know, not talk any nonsense. And you get really fired up. And after four days, you're back doing the same thing again. It's just, it's called, it's, it's uh, mentioned that uh, a person has these faults or forms of austerities. And thinking by doing that, they will make it faster. 
but they can't maintain it because they it's too difficult for them to maintain. So on again, off again. And there's a, there's another there's other uh, there's other narcos. These are two of the six that are mentioned in the second chapter of the Very Contemplative. That's a book that is essential for devotees to read and study. But if you don't read and study that book, you won't know what are the subtle forms of your anarchists and how to overcome them. Either. You'll go on in your devotional service wondering why things are happening the way they are or why things are not happening the way you want them to happen. So we have to be aware of these things and that's why we have all these books. If we don't read the books, study the books, hear from the spiritual teachers regularly, we will go on in a very, you know, half-minded way in devotional service. Maharaj, before I go to Prakshad, you mentioned a point, Maharaj, and in the answer, and thank you, that's a very, thanks for asking that question there, Krishna. Maharaj, you mentioned conscious, that we have to be conscious. And in this age of Kali Yuga, you know, we, we, we're not even connected in, you know, to any, awareness how can one be conscious that they are slacking they are not consistent you know and especially when one doesn't want to take instructions how can they be conscious Maharaj <laughs> <laughs> I go through that sometimes with some you know it's like yeah I'm going to give you an answer that you may find a little bit unusual yes Maharaj <laughs> Yeah, and it's also very practical. So if you live with somebody, ask them what's wrong with you. What do you need to do? Do you have a husband or a wife or somebody who's close to you? Yeah, yeah, ask them, you know, please tell me, you know, where can I improve? What am I what am I doing that I, that I shouldn't be doing and vice versa? What am I not doing that I should be doing? Because people know you better than you know yourself for those who are close to you. That's one way. And the other way is the more direct way is just remember Krishna always. <laughs> and then you always have best, best consciousness. Marge, I have to say that the first one you mentioned, uh, that, that you mentioned is definitely one that I've heard from uh Bhaktivedanta Swami mentioning that in his some of his workshops you know ask someone you know how can I improve or be better or what am I slacking in and and take that instruction and work on ourselves so thank you for reminding that Maharaj thank you yeah I, I was also in one of his workshops that he was doing like this okay and yeah I saw some people didn't want to go through with their exercise either. <laughs> to ask someone what's wrong with you, it's pretty humbling. It's pretty humbling. Yes, Marsh. Yeah, ask somebody who's close to you that cares for you that way you keep that relationship nice. <laughs> yes, Marge. <laughs> I'm going to go to Prickshit and then I'll go to Mother Scarlet because he had his hand up earlier. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept our obeisances. All glory to the Papa. Um, yeah, I was going to ask a question, but I'll make one quick comment since um, CEO was talking about this, this this last thing that you're discussing. That sometimes it's difficult when people uh, are being, or you ask somebody to tell you what's wrong so you can fix it. But I remember by Jeremiah said we have to park our false ego somewhere else before we get ready to hear it because we are gonna hear things we're not gonna like. So <laughs> park the false ego. All right, now that's all I wanted to add. Now my question is about um you define Puvaras, if I heard correctly. Puvaras is loving Krishna before meeting Krishna. That is, uh, and he says, devotees are in Puvaras. Then he got me thinking that from the Shastra it tells us that um, Rukmini heard 
uh, when he was with his brother and his family, Rukmi and the rest of them, they wanted to marry her off to Shishupa. But he had already heard um, the glories of Krishna and she already had fallen in love with Krishna, but he hadn't seen Krishna yet. Is that also Prabhu Ras or pure devotees won't come under that type of Ras? Is it for uh, Prabhu Ras? So my question is, Prabhu Ras is for as conditioned souls only, or do pure devotees like Rukmini also go through something like that? Well, Rukmini is not a, an ordinary personality. He's an expansion of the, the Gopi Chandravali from Vrindavan. So that, that pure love is already there. <laughs> And so just by hearing about Krishna, then she became attracted to Krishna. So poor Ras is, is fueled by the process of hearing more and more. You can say there's an element of poor Ras in that mood, but for the pure devotees, it's, it's not like they have to learn so much about Krishna. That love is already there. For us, the word poor Ras is trying to love Krishna. Because uh, that love still has to be awakened. In the case of uh, Rukmini, it was already awakened. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, March. Yes, Mother Scarlett. Hare Krishna, and thank you for today's class. Uh, May I ask previous class question again? Please forgive my ignorance. May I ask again that question? I Just asked you that. I don't have to understand it. Yeah, I asked you to ask that question, so you're okay. May I ask it? Yeah, because I asked you that. Yes, <laughs> uh, it's uh, Chaitanya uh, Madhyalila 15100A where it says that the devotional service doesn't count before uh, one is uh, not um, initiated. Yeah, there's that statement in that uh, we, we, we actually brought up the text and we read it, that actually any activity, if you don't become initiated, all your activities are useless. That's the word. Prabhupada's making a very clear and powerful statement in relationship to those verses that are being said. Those, there's 108, 107, and 109, those three verses in the Chaitanya Charitam, the Madhya chapter 15, is talking about the holy name. It's talking about the holy name. And the chanting of the holy name is not dependent on a Mishmash. That's mentioned in that section. But Prabhupada wants to give us a clear understanding how that applies in practice. That yes, you can chant the holy names and you don't have to have the initiation to be chanting the holy names. But in order to perform devotional service effectively, practical guidance accordingly is needed from the spiritual master whose duty is to see the disciple and engage them accordingly. Without that uh, practical guidance or accepting the spiritual master, then one will perform devotional service according to what they want to do and how they want to do it. And therefore, it may not always be what the best way that they can make advancement in Krishna consciousness. And so Prabhupada is making a specific point there. But what he's also saying, based on other statements in the scriptures, like Tad Vigyartam Guru Eva Abhigat's story, that one must accept the uh, shelter of a bona fide spiritual master and eventually get initiated. And when Prabhupada would give the lectures on the initiation day, he would say, initiation means beginning. Initiation means beginning. So what are we doing before be, before initiation? We're practicing to begin. Beginning, just like 
you can't swim, and here you are in front of the lake, but you want to go swimming. So you gradually get a feel of the water before you actually dive in, just to get a, get a little understanding what the water is like and how far you can go out before you actually have to start swimming. So this is what the preliminary point, and therefore that is called Adhaustrada Sadhu Sangha. Faith, bringing it into association with devotees, and practicing the process in the association with devotees. Now, if you're practicing the process in the association of devotees in the proper way, you will come to the third stage, which is taking shelter of the bona fide spiritual. If you don't practice that association properly and the activities in that association, you will not be able to come to the next stage. Therefore, all of your activities are useless. That's how it's understood in that context. Because you, unless you go to the stage of initiation, you can't get to the stage of nishta, which is prior after the stage of an art in the Riti. Your an artist will stay. And although you're performing devotional service, you won't be able to make any advancement. You'll do one thing by staying, by, by practicing the process of devotional service before initiation, you're pushing back the effects of suffering in the material world. That is the only benefit you get. You're not actually developing your loving relationship with Krishna. Because Krishna has empowered his representative to give his mercy in the form of um, being his representative in the material world to guide the living entity. We have to accept that guidance and the process by which the guidance is given. And that comes when we accept the spiritual master. So it's like standing on the bank of the river and wanting to swim, getting a feel of the water, and then turning around and going back on to the shore without diving in. So that's why it says that everything you do prior to that is useless unless you come to the next stage. Okay. That's what it means. Thank you. May I ask another minor question, please? Um, just hold that question for a minute. Okay. We'll see if there's any other questions and we'll come back. Does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask? Any, um, Marge, I have a question and I wanted to get a better understanding is when you were speaking about separation and then you were saying that in the, in the material world, um, if, and that is if I heard your, um, your, the, the words you said correctly, is that we maintain that separation for a while and then we forget about it because we forget that connection. And the only way for us to remember that connection is to be engaged in service, Maharaj? Is the, that correct? The eternal that, relationship with Krishna? Yes. To, to, and to feel that separation is to be engaged in service? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, separation is not something that that is static. It's in a mood of it's a mood of wanting to be with Krishna, and that mood is acquiesced or functional through service. I want to be with you, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna serve. And when you're serving, you're actually calling Krishna to come. And when the Krishna is pleased by your service, he may appear before you in one form or another. Simply by you becoming happy is one of the forms that Krishna appears that he's accepted your service. That's really deep. <laughs> that's really deep, Maharaj. Well, that's the process. <laughs> So we should hanker for service. That means we're hankering for Krishna. Amazing. Thank you much. It, 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 
just the way you said it is like wow <laughs> i can see the krishna's face he him and i <laughs> he's blown away <laughs> thank you so much Mar. uh yeah wow krishna's gonna you're gonna chase him and you're gonna catch him for a minute he's gonna smile at you and make you feel good and then he's gonna run away again <laughs> that's what he does he did that to the residents of Vrindavan constantly. <laughs> That's his mood. It's not like you can catch him. <laughs> it's not that easy. It's practically impossible to catch Krishna, but it is possible also. <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost impossible, but slightly possible. But Krishna is always with you because he gives you everything you need. To live your life in devotional service. Thank you so much, Mark. That was really powerful. Thank you so much. Uh, um, Mother Anna, please go ahead. Hi, Krishna. Please set my humble obeisances or grow Srila Prabhupada. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I have just one quick question. I had an experience yesterday where I've been preaching where I am um, to uh, some new friends that I've been making and Nayana's friends with the children as well and we went around the house and had some food and I was talking about Pashan and things like that and then we came home and we had um, Nayana's and I felt it as well it's really strange but I think we brought back an entity or a ghost or something from their house and Nina was really scared at night and um, she, she, I didn't even tell, she just said, mommy, there was a man there and he was, he was looking at you and he was a bad man. And so I literally put Kirtan on in the room. I put the string table on her and I did things and I was, I was kind of like, I think it's gone now, but it really made me like conscious of how do we associate with people that might not be in like the best environment or the area, but, protect ourselves to not bring things back but be able to give them and preach to them without taking anything back you have to be strong <laughs> if you're weak you're going to be affected mm. you have to strengthen your bhakti uh yeah and most people in the material world they're all haunted <laughs> they all carry entities with them <laughs> To one degree or another. Mm. Anybody who takes intoxication, anybody who engages in illicit sex, all of these people carry entities with them. Mm -hmm. mm. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You have to, you have to be careful how you associate. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada said, don't take their association, but give them your association. But in order to give them, you have to be in a position of, you know, uh, spiritual strength. You have to have something to offer. Mm. So it's not that we shouldn't preach, but we can also be, have to be very careful and not allow, you know, their consciousness to become your consciousness. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Garage. If you remain strong in your chanting of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, you're be in the best position to, you know, be unaffected by the effects of the material energy. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Is the ghost gone? I hope so. <laughs> I've, I've been putting gear 10 on the string of Dave oil. Um, so I hope so. We'll see tonight. Yeah, <laughs> the string of string mm mantra. -hmm. Okay. Don't, don't eat food cooked by non devotees. Mm. Okay. That's Thank you, Gary. Thank you. That's what they enter into your consciousness mm. through food, especially grain. Mm. It's true. Okay. Thank you so much.
ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ Well, all all nine stages have service in them. No, the first one, the Tao Strata, that brings you to the association of devotees. The Tao Strata, Sadhu Sangha, is the beginning of your service. Well, the first one doesn't have service in them, but all of the others, that service is done in different ways, different moods. There's nine, processes. There's nine processes of bhakti. So you can see each of the nine processes, how they uh, are applied in the different stages. So the ninth stages, I was uh, uh, thinking on the Sravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Padasyavanam. These are the ones. That, that's going to be there all the way. Always. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. Namrata, you can go with your question. Hare Krishna. I am Blue Base and see all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Kumar, my question was about the Anartha, uh, endeavoring for Anartha. You mentioned that uh, must make some endeavors as well apart from japa so um there are devotees who are just interested in following the process as given by the gurus or uh, the seniors they are not uh, interested in uh, you know they find it difficult to analyze the philosophy and you know impl implementing that so they just follow what is given to them uh, and some are uh, they they like to uh, give analysis and try to uh, look at the intricacies but then uh, what is the difference now uh, is that also all right if devotees are not interested in uh, if they just be, uh, believing uh, yeah maybe the them. Yeah, many of them have gone beyond the stage of reflecting on the anarchies and they have passed that stage. So they're, they're fixed in their devotional service. The devotional service brings about all good qualities. And then when these good qualities appear, the anarchies are also destroyed. So yeah, there are people who are absorbed in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and they don't have to all the time reflect on the different anarchies because they're fixed in, on a higher consciousness already. But you can't imitate that. Just like when you walk into a association of devotees, you have to practice certain qualities in that association. But for a, an advanced devotee, they don't have to think about practicing those qualities. It's a, they already imbibe those qualities. So it's automatic for them. And maybe for us, we have to learn, well, we have to be humble, we have to be tolerant. So it depends on what stage of bhakti you're on. If you're still struggling with the art and the vritti, then you should be aware of those things that are going to pull you down. But if you have passed that stage of an art and the vritti, you're on the stage of... Uh, Uh, not only nishta but ruchi and uh, you're feeling happy all the time in krishna consciousness so then uh, you don't some you don't become so much conscious of all of the things that you shouldn't do because you're fixed on what you should do so guma that in uh, at the neophyte level we need to do that endeavors that is quite necessary for all the devotees you have to know what stage you're on you have to see uh, if you're if you're uh, 
you just recently initiated, then you're working with the Anatta Nivritti stage. When you get to the Nishta stage, that means you're steady in bhakti. Nothing's going to knock you off the practice. You're fixed. No matter how difficult anything comes your way, you're not going to give up devotion as soon as you're not going to give up the association of devotion. That's that's the stage of it. But before then, you might be uh, how the anarchists affect you will be it will be indicated on how you respond. You might you be you might be critical. You might find you might decide well. If I perform devotional service, I get a nice position um, somewhere, or I might even, uh, you know, I might even develop mystic power, and I can do so many wonderful things, or I, uh, I, um, you know, you look towards material benefits in in the practice of devotional service. So if we're still doing that, that means these anarchists are still there. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. That quite clarifies. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Sri Devi, your next Prabhu. Thank you, Anasuya. Yes, Guru Maharaj. I have a question about steadiness. Um, when we come to the platform of Nishtha, does it mean we become steady in our sadhana or does it mean we become steady in service or both? Um, that's an interesting question and that's been brought out by some, some discussions by senior devotees. It's generally, it's generally steady in service. Because if you're steady, in order to be steady in service, you have to be steady in sadhana. Mm. <laughs> right, right. But some, on a higher platform, your service becomes your sadhana. That's for more advanced stages where uh, they're absorbed in service and it's, there's no distinction between sadhana and service. But for us, we have to make that distinction. So generally, nishta really means steady in service. You're not going to give up your service or become less enthusiastic in your service you know, when you reach the stage of nishta. You might be you might be sitting in Jalangi uh, Dam in the evening and uh, you're there with a program and it's in it's becoming dusk and the mosquitoes are coming and there's a nice lecture at the same time but the mosquitoes are attacking you you got your the mosquito repellent but it's not working and so if you run away from the, the lecture because of the mosquitoes you haven't reached Nishta yet. That's <laughs> just a, a kind of a crude example. But in other words, you know, whatever challenges you have from the external environment or from people in general, it's not going to affect your 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 fixation and your devotional service. Well, that person said something bad to me, and I feel so happy, unhappy, I'm not going to the temple. Hmm. <laughs> That's Maya. So, what if we are steady in our chanting? We have become steady at that level. But in our practices, we are not able to still become steady Say in going for Mangal Arati. We're only managing, say, Darshan Arati and class, Guru Puja morning program from 
7 a.m. onwards, which is, I'm talking about my situation. How can we um, come to the point where we can actually go, become steady for even Mangalar? Prabhupada didn't go to Mangalarti, but he told us we should go. <laughs> because he, at that time, he was busy with his translation. You can't imitate them. Try to follow the prayer. If you can't go to Mangalarti, then have Mangalarti where you are. So Mangalarti at home, and then we can go for Darshanarti. Well, <laughs> If you can go for Mangalarti, go for it. If there's circumstances that make it impossible or difficult, then uh, substitute going from by performing Mangalarti where you are. Okay. There are some people who live outside of the temple area, maybe too far from their temple, or it's just not practical to go because they have to go to work or something. So they, they do Mangalarti at home with their family. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shruti. Very nice questions. You have to Actually, understand oh. devotional service is not is both transcendental and practical. Mm. Use your intelligence how to execute devotional service. Yeah. It's practical too. Thank you, Maharaj. Raj Prabhu, you unmuted yourself, so I'm thinking you have a question, Prabhu. Sorry, that was by accident. Oh, okay. Just wanted to make sure that I did not, you know, that you're not gonna know. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else has a question to ask? This has been such a nice uh discussion and sharing and Lots of questions. I have to go back and play this lecture again and make my notes. If there are no questions, Maharaj, we thank you so much for joining us. Maharaj, normally I would ask you to chant around, but I know that you have to get ready to leave. Okay, we'll do a round. Haribo. 